I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about evolutionary biology, which is what I study and which I think is one of the most exciting things in science to study because it explains so much. And of course, all of you remember from taking biology that evolution is really the best explanation that we have for the diversity of life on Earth. But before I start talking about it in a little bit more detail, I want to remind you about what evolution is and isn't. So the short kind of jargony explanation is that evolution is descent with modification, which is a fancy way of saying that things change over time. But there's a really important point there that sometimes people miss. So lots of things change over time. For example, leaves turn red in the autumn and fall off, and so the leaves on a tree change through time. But that's not evolution. What you have to have happening for evolution to occur is that something has to be passed on from parents to offspring. And so it's not just a matter of change over time. And even though people talk about evolution happening in their lives or they say, oh, my thoughts on that have evolved, that's not exactly what, what we're talking about when we refer to evolution in science. So I'm going to talk about, so, so what, I, what I tell people I study when they ask me, and I really want to give a short answer, is that I say I study bug sex. And I do study bug sex, and I'm going to tell you about bug sex in just a minute. But I want to get to that by talking about evolution. So a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with what natural selection is. And it's illustrated here on the side of the slide, where you've got a bunch of birds that eat bugs. And the birds can see the different colors of bugs. So they can see orange bugs and green bugs. And they really like the green bugs. So they eat the green bugs out of the population. And eventually, all that's left are the orange bugs. What that means is that the population of bugs has evolved because the bug parents have passed their genes for being what color they are to their babies, and you end up with them surviving and leaving more of the, that color than others. And so evolution's happened. And it's really as simple as that. Sometimes when people talk about evolution, they make it really complicated or they think it means something that it doesn't, but this is all that's involved. So you just have natural selection that means that individuals that can survive better and leave more babies are going to predominate in the population. And there you go. And it's a, it's a really simple but tremendously powerful idea. Well, I'm interested in a really particular part of evolution that has to do with sex. Because if you think about it, a lot of animals have things about them that don't seem like they would really help them survive very well. Like, for example, you've got this great big tail on a male peacock, and I'm sure a lot of you have been to a zoo and seen, you know, peacock tails. Those things are not really very useful. You know, you can't find food with them. Um, you can't, uh, you know, they're not useful for digging holes. They're just attractive. And then you've got things like the horns or antlers on deer and bighorn sheep and things like that. Well, those too, you can't find food with them. You can't dig a hole with them. And in fact, with the tail of the peacock, you're more conspicuous. You can be found better by predators that can say, whoa, look at that from a distance. There's this great, big, gorgeous, you know, colorful tail. So it seems like animals have a lot of, of things about them that don't seem like they would have resulted from that process I just described, where you know you survive better because you get away from your predators or you find food better. So how does that work? Well, evolution again. Except it's a very special kind that instead of being called natural selection, is called sexual selection. And here, there's two kinds of traits of animals that can arise from sexual selection. One of them are weapons, things like the horns on the bighorn sheep, where if you have great big horns and a really hardened skull, you can bash another male on the head with it. And that's exactly what they do. And there's also lots of other animals that have these weapons, like the beetles you can see on the slide, where it's the same thing. They're small, although they're kind of they're big for beetles. They're like this big. Um, but they still do exactly the same thing. Males fight with each other, and the one that's the better fighter will win. In the case of some of the flashy colors and sort of pretty ornaments that animals have, it's not so much they're fighting with them, and that's true of the peacock tail too. So peacocks can't take their tail and whack another male you know, over the head with it, or I mean, if they did, it wouldn't really do very much good. But 
what they do do is display those colors or sing their songs like that frog is doing, and that attracts females, and females pick the most colorful male or the one that sings the best song. And that little spider on the, uh, holding his legs up on the very end there is a peacock spider, and he is so small he could sit on your pinky fingernail, but if you look through a microscope, he is the most beautiful animal ever. I think he's actually prettier than a real peacock. Um, and they do really fancy displays. And if you Google peacock spider, you will see some gorgeous, gorgeous dances. OK. So I've just said that you can have things going on from sexual selection, which means that traits are useful in sex. They're useful because they get you more mates. They're useful because you can beat up other males and get them away from your mates. But then what happens if those characteristics and the characteristics that make you able to survive and reproduce disagree. And that can happen a lot. And I'm showing it here by showing you a bat that's a predator on frogs. What the bat does is listen for the frog making its croak. And so it's always the male frogs that are croaking in the ponds. They're doing it right now. It's spring. Frogs are all out there um, in all the, the ponds and streams around here, and they're making all this noise. It's the males that are making noise to attract females. But if you make noise, you could attract the attention of somebody you did not necessarily want to attract. And in this case, it's attracted the, uh, the attention of this predatory bat. So it's like the two parts of evolution, natural and sexual selection, are disagreeing. Well, what happens there? This is exactly what I study. And I study it by looking not at bats and frogs, but by looking at what I think is a way cooler example, which are flies and crickets. OK, crickets do the same thing that frogs do. The males chirp to attract a mate, right? So you've all heard crickets uh, calling. If you go outside in the evening, they go chirp, chirp, chirp. And that's always the males. You never hear females, because the females can't produce the call. So the males are chirping to attract a female. But in some crickets, what happens is that they also attract a parasitic fly. And that fly is shown here. What happens is that the fly hears the male making his song to attract a female cricket, but what the fly does instead is drop her larvae, her little babies, on top of and around the male cricket. And this one's shown here that uh, is next to a human hair, so they're really tiny. You almost can't see them. What these larvae do is burrow inside the body of the cricket while the cricket is still alive, and then they eat the insides of the cricket while the cricket is still alive. Yeah, it's, it's OK to be grossed out by this part. Um, they eat the cricket while the cricket is still alive. And they do that for about a week. So the cricket is wandering around, like, you know, making noise like a cricket and walking, you know, looking just like a normal cricket from the outside. But if you dissect him, if you open him up, which is what I did here, so that is a maggot. That is the larva of the fly that's been growing up inside the body of the cricket. And they, when they get really big, they pretty much occupy the whole cricket from kind of here to here. So it's a big, a big um, uh, problem for the cricket. And eventually, when the fly larva emerges, it kills the cricket and then uh, you know, it's, and, and they really do burst out, and it really is just like all these science fiction, you know, things where the alien uh, being is bursting out of the cricket and, or out of the uh, host and, and so forth. So, okay, what that means from an evolutionary standpoint is if you're a cricket, you have a problem. If you call and you attract a mate, Evolution says, yes, this is fabulous, because you attracted a mate. You are going to leave your genes in future generations. Life is good. That's what evolution is all about. OK. But evolution also says, if you call, this is bad, because you will attract this deadly fly, which will put maggots on you that will eat you from the inside out. This is not a good thing. Do not call. So the males have these completely opposite messages that are coming saying, yes, call. Calling is really good. No, don't call. Calling is really bad. Yes, call. No, don't call. Yet. And so what I study is kind of how the crickets figure this out. What do they do? How do they end up evolving under those disagreeing selection pressures? So I study this not in this area or even in Minnesota, which is where, uh, where I live, but in Hawaii. 
because Hawaii happens to have a kind of cricket where they get this parasite, parasitic fly, but the cricket also lives in other places like northern Australia and some of the Pacific Islands like Fiji where they don't get the fly. So it's kind of like I've got an experiment that nature has put on for me right in front of my eyes. Because I can say, well, in Hawaii, the crickets have this call, calling is good, don't call, calling is bad problem. But in the rest of the places where the crickets occur, they don't have that problem. So I can ask, well, what happens then? How did this get resolved by evolution? And I've been studying this for a long time, and one of the things I do for that is to understand about cricket song and to analyze how crickets sing. And so just to explain really briefly, the way crickets sing is by rubbing their wings together. So sometimes you, you hear people say that they rub their legs together, that's wrong. Grasshoppers sometimes rub their legs together to sing, but they're completely different animals. So crickets rub their wings together to call, and they have specialized structures that allow them to do that. And what, it's sort of like what would happen if um, you rub your fingernail across uh, a comb, that it makes kind of a brr, brr noise. And so that's exactly what cricket songs are, is they have these specialized structures. They don't have a comb and a fingernail, but they have something that's essentially like that. And so every time the wings close, you get what's called a pulse of sound, and all of those together make the chirp. So what you're hearing is a cricket song. What you're hearing is one male who's closing his wings really, really fast over a short period of time. This is what it looks like, this diagram in red here. And each of the lines going up is a pulse or a wing closure. And then the way those are timed gives you the way a cricket song sounds like. And so this cricket, the one I study, kind of has, um, it's kind of syncopated, so it goes and I'm going to ask you to listen to that when we play the song again. Okay, that's the pattern that the males call when they're uh, closing their wings. Now, we found out quite a while ago that crickets from places where they have this risk of the parasite landing on them and dropping the maggots that eat them from the inside out, they have slightly different songs that make them a little bit harder to detect. So they've escaped being found by the fly a little bit, but they can't escape it very well. And when I was studying the flies or, and the crickets, I actually made this amazing discovery, which was that I got to see evolution happen right in front of me. Now, on two of the Hawaiian islands where we were working, we suddenly saw, and it really was suddenly, it happened just over a couple of years, a new kind of male that became really common, and I started finding them all the time, that turned out to be a genetic variant, a, new, a, new, a mutant, a male that had a different kind of gene that meant he couldn't call. And this new gene spread in the population really, really quickly. It spread in about five years, and the crickets have about three to four generations a year, and so that's how we tend to, we calculate how evolution happens is a number of generations, right, because you're passing stuff from the parents to uh, their children. And this was about 20 generations. So if that was going to happen in people, it would be like just a few hundred years, which is unbelievably fast. So, but the point is that I think this happened because the males that happened to have a new, this new gene survived better because the flies can't find them because the flies can only find them by listening to them. So that's what it looks like. I, I, so, so this is um, a really, really, really magnified um, version of what a cricket wing looks like. So this weird structure here is the file that the males use. Like I said, it's sort of like that, that comb that uh, the fingernail gets scraped on. And that's what a normal, if you look really close at a normal cricket wing, that's exactly what it looks like. It's got this file on it. So this is an electron microscope photograph here that shows it really, really super magnified. A female cricket on the bottom doesn't have any of those specialized structures. And females never sing. They just can't make the chirps at all. The only chirps you're going to hear are from males. But here's this new, in the middle, is this new kind of male that arose. And it's a new male that doesn't have the same kind of file that the normal male does, and he's protected from the fly. All right, so 
That's great for half of the problem, so that's great for, you know, now the flies can't find him. How does he manage to find a mate if he can't call? That's exactly what we're working on. So I don't have the answer to that. Um, I have the answer almost. Um, we're working on it in a, a bunch of different ways. Um, what we think is happening is that these new males, which we're calling flat wings, because that's what their wings look like, they look flat, these new males seem to be more likely to just hang around the, the few calling males that still are in the population. So they're still just sort of standing there. They're not really saying anything. They're just standing there. But what that means is that when a female gets attracted to one of those calling males, they can get in the way and try to mate with her. And that seems to work OK for them. But we're still working on this. Um, and I, I, finding that evolution happened in action was just one of the coolest things that has ever happened in my career. And I stumbled on it kind of by accident. So, so that's one of the other things I wanted to tell you is that not just that evolution happens all the time, but that as long as you're paying attention, you can find out something that no one else has ever noticed before. Insects, I think, are the greatest things ever for studying how evolution happens. Partly because there's a lot of them. Um, so how many, does anybody know how many kinds of insects there are? Anybody want to want to shout out an answer? 3,000, somebody said 3,000, somebody said 900. You are so wrong. Did, did somebody say a million? Yay for the person who said a million that were in the front row. Okay, yay for the person who said a million. Um, however, you're sort of, so you're sort of right, but you're sort of wrong because scientists have not discovered probably the majority of insects that are on the planet. So we've described a million insects, but you know what? There could be up to 10 million, which is pretty incredible to think about, and they're things that could be discovered in all of your lifetime. What that means is, and this is, this is um, what I have uh, for the um, insect of the month uh, thing there, is that uh, if you had an insect of the month calendar, you know how like they have calendars with puppies and kittens and pandas and you know all of that? So how many years do you think it would take um, uh, to run out of insects if you had a different insect every month? <laughs> Wrong! Um, uh, it's 80,000, actually. So that means that if you wanted to invest in a calendar company and you wanted to make sure that, you know, they had a different insect, you, sh you should go for, you, you, or a different animal, you should go for insects because you'd run out of birds, you'd run out of mammals, you'd run out of everything, but it would take you a long, long time to run out of insects. Um, and also, I think that insects are great in part because I think insects are beautiful, and that's a, a, a kind of insect that probably a lot of you um, don't know what is, but I think it's particularly beautiful uh, and I would encourage all of you to use insects as a way to study evolution and then understand how the world works. Thank you very much.